Thanks very much. Can everyone hear me okay? Yes? Usually being an American, it's not a problem, but I just have to check. <laughs> Thanks, everybody, for coming out tonight. Um, and as I say, I should thank, in the first instance, the Royal Irish Academy, who are sponsoring uh, my visit here, and also the Woodrow Wilson National Fellowship Foundation in the U.S., who funded the research sabbatical that I'm currently on. Uh, for 2011 uh, to 2012. And many thanks also for this opportunity to come back to Sydney and speak a little bit um, about not only the Sydney project, but the other monumental projects that I've been quite interested in looking at over the last uh, five to six years. And what I want to talk about today has to do with the subject of, of my book, which Ronan mentioned, which is, will be finished uh, in a few months' time, called Remembering the Irish Famine. And this book, really what it looks at is the complex place of the famine in terms of its uh, place in memory and representation, its visual representation, from the 19th century right up until the present. And also how its more recent commemorative visualizations reveal a very conflicted struggle for national and ethnic self-definition within what we might describe today as a crowded international marketplace of memory and heritage. And as we know, for nearly 150 years, the memory, any sense of a public or collective memory of the famine period has proved elusive. Let's see if I can get my images to work here. So this is an image of a famine graveyard in Pula in County Waterford. Of course, the famine proved ill-suited to the teleology of Irish nationalism, which posited the Easter Rising as the, moment, as the nation's supreme moment of self-realization. And the horrors and the shame associated with the famine period condemned its representations to the margins of Irish history and remembrance. So what changed then in the mid-1990s to move the famine um, from, I suppose, what is often termed to be an unspeakable kind of event to what is possibly now the most visualized experience of the Irish across the globe? Why, how, why and how has the trope of famine silence, as it were, been reversed over this short period? And it's really within the space of two decades the number of permanent monuments to the famine has risen from a small handful to nearly 100, which is an extraordinary amount in a short period of time. Here's just a kind of a collage of images of some of these monuments that have been erected in the last 10, 15 years. And they range from simple community-led memorials to complex public artworks, which top out at around $5 million US, which by any stretch of the imagination is a massive uh, public art project. And this rapid mount monumentalization of the famine, which has occurred in Ireland, Britain, in Canada, the United States, in, and Australia, suggests the convergence of a renewed interest in famine history with increasingly global paradigms of commemoration. But the paradox of famine remembrance lies in the dual allegiance to the concerns and practices of contemporary commemoration, what the philosopher Andreas Heisen has called the hypertrophy of modern memory over history, and also what we see is an increasing homogeneity of commemorative aesthetics in different geographical contra uh, contexts. And in the case of the famine, the persistent predilection, particularly in the diaspora, and some of the examples I'll talk about today, towards a bombastic, a highly emotive, and a quintessentially Victorian visual iconography of famine. So despite the couching of much Irish commemorative language in popular international discourses, of historical trauma and also in the dialogue of Holocaust remembrance, its visual representation has often insisted upon an aesthetically anachronistic literal projection of the imagined famine or immigrant ancestor into our present. And this is a strategy of explicit embodiment which sits somewhat awkwardly amongst other kinds of commemorative monuments that we see happening in the last 10 or 15 years. And the predilection in, in many of those examples of minimalism, for example, as an aesthetic strategy, which we see, for example, in the, in the recent 9-11 memorial at Ground Zero or the Monument to the Murdered Jews of Europe in Berlin by Peter Eisenman. And just as an example of, of one of these kind of very, de I suppose, uh, devoutly figurative monuments is this uh, monument, which is in the Gaelic Park of Oak Forest, Illinois, from 1999. Now, throughout the 1990s, uh, I had to put this up here. <laughs> it's now a little piece of history, isn't it? Uh, anywho, the man who's been much on Irish news lately. In any case, but throughout the 1990s, uh, the, the President Mary Robinson, who obviously you don't see here, but in any case promoted the notion of a, of a shared famine heritage between Ireland 
and its diaspora. And diaspora is going to be central to what I'm talking about uh, today. But really, I think the outcomes of the 150th anniversary demonstrate that this concordance, this sh the notion of a shared famine heritage, is really illusory. And in Ireland, the legacy of the famine remains one of displacement and death, which is now apprehended by a post-colonial nation whose economic fortunes have largely reversed, although they're kind of swinging back the other way now, nowadays. And of course, the famine remains subject to endless instrumentalization across the Irish political spectrum, as I'll expand on later. And in the diaspora, the, fa the famine remains part of the foundation myth of immigrant nations and is often utilized as a vehicle for asserting ethnic difference by what is sometimes a shrinking demographic. And this varies depending on the country in question. And I think the recent ongoing uh, construction of these famine sites of memory is not an indicator that we have an assured mastery over the famine past, but rather these sites are signifiers of social anxiety, of political conflict and crises of identity. And within immigration studies itself, there's been increasing calls to focus on what's called transnational uh, histories of, of immigration. So rather than focusing on the single nation state, what we should be looking at is these historical accounts as they're shared across countries. And I think in the case of the famine and the famine's commemoration, this is a perfect instance in which we can apply these kinds of methodologies. And so it's my hope that the book that I'm writing will help to illuminate these aspects of meaning and identity and how they're created, how they're negotiated and constructed um, through the visual language and symbolic structures of memory and commemoration. And also underscore the reasons why public art has become such a prominent medium through which these ideas um, are are constructed and presented. So embodying the figure of the famine victim or Irish migrant at these newly conceived sites of memory is complicated by the oppositional forces of presence and absence that haunt the visual and representational history of the famine and of 19th century Irish migration. Of course, because this is a history marked in the main by death, by exile, by dispersion, the famine's recent reemergence into the resolutely material and monumental sphere of public memory elicits a paradox of representation. Right? How can we begin to apprehend this fractious yet immense social experience at the site of commemoration? And what indeed is the visual legacy of the famine that we have from the 19th century? How does it continue to haunt our present in so many ways? So if 20th century uh, attempts to give visual form to famine memory are to be understood within a tradition of famine image making. The obvious antecedents lie in the paintings, the drawings, the engravings, and to a lesser extent the photographs of the 19th century. So who was depicting the famine at the time of its occurrence and why? And certainly the crisis in Ireland uh, in the 1840s was a topic of keen interest for English and Irish newspapers and the literate English public were offered accounts of forays through famine-stricken Ireland. And this continued the tradition of the 18th century travelogue. But now what we have is the famine visualized through the medium of wood engraving, because the famine coincides with the rise of illustrated journalism. Right? The Illustrated London News, one of the most important periodicals of the 19th century, was founded in 1842. The famine begins in 1845. So you have this kind of convergence of the technology of illustrated newspapers with the famine to, to create something quite unusual and particular. And now we have increasingly specialized technologies of distribution and dissemination of visual images to a wider public than was ever the case before. Now, by the early 18th, the, the Illustrated New, the London News, of course, is one of the best examples. And I also wanted to show you an image of the Hall paper. Oftentimes, these images tend to be pulled out, which is a real bugbear of the art historian. You have to look at it all in context, right? So all the images, how they actually work together on the physical page of the newspaper. They illustrated this kind of whole folio was maybe about that big by about that tall, so the images are, are quite substantial, as you can see, in terms of their size. Now, folks often ask me, are there any photographs of the famine? Now, certainly, by the 1840s, early photography was in limited use in Ireland, but its pioneers were neither equipped nor were they inclined to train their camera's eye on any kind of Irish social subject, really, until the 1880s. So any images that we have, really, of the Irish poor date from about 40 years after the famine. So certain of these images, interestingly, as I'll talk about a little bit later, have come to become absorbed within the famine lexicon. But there is actually no contemporary photograph of the famine itself. Now, in terms of painting within the academy, a few artists turned their hands 
to the subject of Ireland's distress, taking poverty, emigration, or political unrest as subject, such as the very famous um, painter G.F. Watts, the English painter who painted this image, uh, The Irish Famine, 1849 to 1850. The social subject pictures remained really a minority interest within painting practice until later in the century. Nevertheless, what we do have are numerous painted interpretations of the Irish during and just after the famine period, which offer evidence of how this catastrophic and proximate experience was accommodated within the fairly rigid confines of Victorian aesthetic principles. And it's become sort of commonplace to declare that the famine, uh, the visual record of the famine, rather, is disappointingly sparse, and thus reinforce the reputation of the famine as an unrepresentable event. Yet I believe that if you closely examine the visual history, it, we, we see that something else is happening here, that this is really a legacy and a history that's still waiting to be defined. And the need to critically reassess the visual legacy of the famine from the 19th century is lent urgency, I think, to a certain extent by the unproblematic way in which many of these 19th century images are absorbed and reconstructed uh, today. So images, or engravings rather, from the Illustrated London News, Punch, are frequently used as chapter dividers, book jacket covers, or in the case of this image here from Illustrated London News, translated quite literally into the form of a commemorative monument. Photographs from the 1880s are frequently misidentified, even in historical texts, as being famine images. Yet with the exception, perhaps, of political or satirical cartoons, famine visual imagery has generally been utilized as a useful kind of mimetic illustration of a textual history, rather than as, than as an object of inquiry in its own right. And if we look at a survey of these images, contemporary with the experience of famine, they raise really a multitude of questions that have yet to be really seriously addressed by scholars, art historical or otherwise. What is the relationship of text, reportage text, and the accompanying illustration? What is the deployment, the frequency, and the repetition of iconography which emerges in the 19th century? <coughs> what is the ideological and political context of these images? And how can we begin to evaluate them based on aesthetic and artistic criteria? And this whole subject of 19th century uh, uh, famine visuality is a subject um, of, su of significant complexity that I don't have time to address today. But what I believe one of the key issues connecting uh, the, these initial visual responses to the famine to more <coughs> contemporary depictions, which is most of what I'll be talking about today, is the issue of proximity. In other words, the conditions of viewership and subjectivity that govern the relationship between the spectator and the spectacle of Irish suffering. And certainly in the 19th century, the evocation of real emotion and empathy for the famine victim and the departing emigrant formed a central function of both engraving and painting. And the charitable intent of many of these visualizations renders this purpose clear. Nevertheless, the notion that these images were meant to provoke a charitable uh, reaction limits the modes of representation possible. Too graphic an image, and the viewer moves quickly past pity or sympathy through to disgust. And far from a simple exchange of funds from wealthy to poor, the codes of charitable intent and action are inextricably constituted within the ideological system imposed by and inhabited by the donor. Likewise, as artistic education and patronage for Irish subject pictures continue to be constituted within the colonial relationship in the 19th century, and it essentially revolved around the academies, the exhibitions, and the art market of London, all of these images of the famine that we have from the 19th century essentially pander at some level to the sensibilities of the contemporary English viewer. Very few of them were executed with the Irish viewer specifically in mind, because that's where the marketplace was. Hence, if we look at some uh, famine era paintings, despite the Scottish painter Erskine Nicol, you see one of his works from the National Gallery on the left-hand side, despite his close interaction with Ireland over many, many years, we don't see pictures of agrarian unrest or gruesome suffering, but stage Irish snapshots. The Cork painter here, Daniel MacDonald, whose painting hangs just down the hall from me uh, in UCD's folklore collection, was actually a gift by Cecil Woodham Smith, who wrote the, uh, the Great Hunger to the Folklore uh, Institute. But this painting here, he's the only Irish painter, who was the only painter really to actually paint a, 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 an image specifically of the famine, the discovery of the potato blight. But here what he offers is picturesque melodrama. It's not a discomforting uh, image of social realism. So whether implicitly or explicitly acknowledged, the Victorian English viewer hovers all over all famine-era imagery. 
What I think is interesting, though, is that the, in, in terms of the replication of famine-related images and iconography derived from these 19th century sources, in more recent years, describes a certain inversion of relationship that has taken place. No longer do we wish to stay outside that cottage door or maintain a distance from the famine sufferer. And this issue of the reclamation of the famine victim from what's been described as a disinterested and distanced history it is one that came to permeate the discourse of 150th anniversary commemorations. Yet seeing in the famine victim what has been termed a vision of ourselves, um, as one interviewee described it, is compelling, and yet I think at the, still at the same time it's a deeply problematic set of empathetical identifications. Now to move on ahead, uh, a century ahead, and just talk a little bit about uh, what Rowan, uh, Rowan alluded to in terms of the 1940s and what was the response, visual and otherwise, to the famine's uh, centenary. And aside from the uh, commissioning of the scholarly volume by De Valera, um, and the, also the important folklore commission survey uh, from the famine that was undertaken between 1944 and 1945, this shows an image of, of one of these records. They're all handwritten. Again, they're in the UCD folklore archive. Of, of people's memories of the fan. So aside from the historical volume and then this uh, major work from the Folklore uh, Commission, the 100th anniversary of the famine passed in Ireland without widespread official or popular recognition. I think it's important to recognize it didn't really occur on either level. It wasn't just the official uh, absence. Now, since then, this rather subdued governmental recognition of this anniversary has drawn the opprobrium of, of some 1990s commentators. But I think it's not particularly difficult to imagine how a newly emergent, economically precarious independent state might have been disinclined to commemorate a devastating event whose dimensions were still fully, not fully understood at the time. And there was very little famine history even written in the 1940s, a very small professional historian population in Ireland in any case. And Ireland's heavy economic reliance on the United Kingdom at the time further discouraged calls for national commemorations. And as well, there were severe food shortages in 1946 and in 1947, which rendered famine a subject very close to the bone. A debate, a debate raged in the doll over whether Ireland should be exporting food at all from Ireland to a war-torn Europe in the late 1940s. So if the government made for an unlikely instigator of commemorations, what <coughs> then of the general public? Again, no parades, very, very few monuments, no memorials, no other forms of commemoration appeared. Now, the absence of extensive commemorative activity at the popular level has since been oftentimes interpreted as a, the avoidance of deep and painful famine memories. Since the elderly alive in the 1940s were often separated by only a generation or two from direct experience of the famine. However, in the 1990s, the characterization of the famine, or of the an anniversary in the 1940s, as a kind of psychological repression of famine memory. Now this is something which, of course, this type of language privileges more contemporary, psychoanalytically correct means of confronting the historical past. I think this often sometimes fails to account for the very pragmatic reasons also why the famine failed to register on the commemorative front. And certainly we can look at the very imprecise nature of the famine itself. Its lack of central characters, lack of central narrative, lack of historic episodes or key dates to celebrate. And all of these things sat awkwardly within Irish traditions of both national and popular commemoration. As well, the geographic and the social imbalance, the famine's devastation, and the complexities of its legacy, which were in, uh, very, still very potent in 1940s Ireland, and the source of much bitterness in many local communities, particularly with respect to land ownership. This further rendered any kind of communal agreement over its memory unlikely. And if the St. Patrick's Day edition of the American magazine Colliers in 1951 is any indication its cover was optimistically emblazoned Ireland today from great famine to great future, there existed considerable feeling that improvements to Ireland's economic and political condition could only be achieved through a forward-looking confidence, a future where the famine past held little relevance. Well, I think what's important to distill from the example of the 1940s is that the chronological fact of a commemorative anniversary in and of itself constitute uh, uh, the sole precondition for stimulating widespread interest in commemoration or in history and memory. And it reminds us that commemorative activity or its absence is something which is culturally and temporally determined. So I'd like to turn now a little bit to talk about why it is that the famine came to assume such pride of place um, within uh, recent, more recent expressions of Irish and diasporic uh, collective memory in the 1990s. 
So if we talk about the 1990s uh, family commemorations, we have to set them within Ireland's most profound period of economic prosperity. Also within a mature, well-connected diaspora, which yet in many quarters was experiencing a major struggle over its sense of Irish identity and demographics. And also within what's been described as a memory culture worldwide where elaborate commemorative and memorial activities have become more commonplace for a whole range of different kinds of historical experiences. And in February 1995, President Mary Robinson addressed the Houses of the Oireachtas. This is a right she has under the Constitution, which she only invoked one other time before, and only one other president had invoked it before her, who was Eamon, Eamon de Valera. And she addressed the Houses, setting out her vision of the 150th commemoration that was to commence that year. And her statement effectively outlines the major themes of famine commemoration that were to emerge in the years after her address. First was what she described as the moral imperative to address contemporary famine, derived from a sense of historical responsibility and sympathetic suffering. Second was a focus on the Irish immigrant diaspora as a major repository of famine memory and sorrow. And third was the recasting of tragic histories as narratives of trauma, renewal, or triumph. And these themes would permeate both the products and the processes of the 150th uh, anniversary period, albeit to differing degrees depending on which national context you're talking about. And within Ireland itself, uh, the program of commemorations and all of the local, uh, national, international activities, these evolved within a political climate where the contemporary significance of the famine was at yet was still uh, not not quite determined. Right, we still have ongoing violence in Northern Ireland, with the peace process far from resolute from resolved at the time of Robinson's address. With growing economic prosperity, which precipitated articulations of a new relationship between Britain and expanded Irish influence as well within the European Union. And as well, we have the emergence of a new globalized Irish identity that sought to renew and refresh links with the diaspora, and all of this formed the backdrop against which the famine's memory would be staged. As Cormac Grotto, one of my colleagues at UCD, has observed, the commemorations probably spoke far more about Ireland of the 1990s than Ireland of the 1840s. And that this groundswell of interest in reviving and reconstituting family memory, that this took place during one of Ireland's most profound periods of political and economic change is of no coincidence. And in the direction, in the, in the diaspora in Britain, in the US, Canada, and Australia, we can see both the evidence and the influence of the Irish state's official programs, but also um, state federal politics that are unique to each country. So, for example, in the United States, the dominating presence of the ancient order of Hibernians, their political interests, and also it increased public initiatives to assert ethnic difference in the United States. That's an element of, of the US commemorations. Or in Canada and Australia, the federal politics of multiculturalism and its discontents have an impact in those countries. And in Ireland itself, awareness of the 150th anniversary has been growing since the 1980s. And a major force in the commemorations uh, was Action from Ireland, which is an NGO very active, still aid and development issues. And they launched their Great Famine Project in 1984. And they've staged a series of famine walks, which continue to, to this period as well, to raise awareness of, of uh, contemporary famine. And it was during their seventh annual famine walk in Lewisburg County, Mayo, when Finnefo Minister Tom Pitt officially announced the establishment of the Irish government's National Famine Commemoration Committee in 1994. So apart from the sort of centralized structure that this committee lent activities, the monies which they distributed were meant to reflect all levels of commemoration, from local cemetery cleanups to massive outdoor public events, spread fairly thinly over a wide geographic area. And prioritized expenditures included the development of the National Famine Memorial, which is now located in Mayo, this competition held for it at the time, and also the National Famine Museum, which is now located in uh, County Roscommon in Strokestown. A series of concerts, plays, exhibitions, lectures, the renovation of local famine graveyards and archaeological excavations, and a whole wide range of activities in the UK, US, Australia, Canada, and of course, Ireland. And adding momentum to the alignment of famine memory with contemporary overseas aid was President Mary Robinson, who zealously embraced the commemorations and donned the mantle of diasporic ambassador. She made appearances at commemorative ceremonies and memorial unveilings uh, around the world. And in many of these commemoration speeches and these memorial unveiling speeches, she makes frequent reference 
uh, to her visits to refugee camps in Somalia, Tanzania, and Zaire, and stressed the Irish responsibility for humanitarian action and a keener perspective, which she said, quote, springs directly from our self-knowledge as a people, end quote. And this moral responsibility of sympathetic suffering, which is manifested in officially sponsored activities and rhetoric during this period, is also enshrined in the main dedication on the National Salmon Memorial in Mayo by John Bean, the detail of which you see here, which was unveiled during her presidency. And it says, to honor the memory of all who died, suffered, and emigrated due to the Great Famine of 1845 to 1850, and to victims of all famines. The deployment of famine memory to address wider social and global issues was nonetheless a complicated association fraught with conflicting impulses. And that famine history and memory could be taken as a metaphor for any number of causes indicated the real danger of loss of specific historical meaning through fractured, sometimes spurious comparison beyond mere rhetorical flourishes. And the extremes that were enabled by this kind of ideological flexibility of famine memory um, I suppose it's, it's probably best demonstrated by the 1996 Senate sessions, uh, which marks the 150th anniversary. If anyone gets up and, and has a few minutes to speak about uh, their uh, perceptions of the famine's significance. Uh, in this series of speeches, appeals of famine to famine memory were used for support uh, for such widely varying uh, political causes as North Korean humanitarian aid, the claim of a U.S. created famine in Cuba, and the abolishment of abortion. So the famine is marshaled in all these different ways. And additionally, of course, the National Irish Commemorations took great pains to acknowledge the fierce and distinct custody of famine memory in the diaspora, where narratives of 19th century suffering and emigration have long formed a central touch point of Irish diasporic identity. And famine anniversary celebrations in Britain, the US, Canada, and Australia generally fell under the purview of local heritage groups, some which of course have been in existence for many years, like the Ancient Order of Hibernians or the Friendly Sons of St. Patrick. And in other communities, they're groups of more recent vintage. And all of them tend to be or linked together by networks and umbrella committees uh, created across different community groups, sometimes very specifically in response to the anniversary itself. And the informal configuration of many groups and also the reliance on lengthy fundraising campaigns for many monuments means that a number of these major diasporic famine commemorations appeared many years after the Irish government's official celebrations or marking period uh, had ended. The Philadelphia Irish Memorial, for example, was unveiled in 2003, and Toronto's Famine Memorial, which you see here, unveiled in summer 2007. So in many respects, 1997 seems to have marked the beginning, not the end, of commemorative activity, which decontinues on into the present day. I'm constantly getting emails from folks inviting me to their uh, famine memorial uh, unveiling ceremonies and going to one in County Mead in three weeks' time. So this is an ongoing endeavor. Uh, so, but I've sketched very briefly uh, for you here some of the backdrop to the famine commemorative period. And I'd like to turn now to an overview of its monumental uh, productions because this is, I suppose, what my uh, particular interest is. And certainly these kinds of brick and mortar monuments don't constitute, or certainly didn't constitute the only form of commemorative response during the 1990s. But I think what the example of the famines, uh, monuments, and memorials offers is a concrete example of how such diverse groups and agendas all coalesced around a single anniversary. And from the perspective of someone like me, someone who works in art history and visual culture, it also offers insight into what role art can play in the articulation of these memories and meanings. So for the past six or seven years, I've traveled around Ireland, Northern Ireland, England, Scotland, Wales, the US, Canada, and Australia, documenting these examples of famine monuments and interviewing the dozens of artists, community groups, and individuals who sponsored and created them. <coughs> and these site visits and interviews have revealed a, a, a striking commemorative landscape. Close to 100 famine memorial projects executed over the last 10 years. Uh, five of these projects had budgets over 1 million euro, so big projects, some of them. And also very significant uh, representational differences uh, in the choices that have been made in different national contexts, whether Canadian, Australian, Irish, British, or American. As well, a passionate and often fierce embrace of the commemorative enterprise by largely grassroots uh, local history groups and diasporic organizations and a plurality of famine memories articulated by these various projects. And no small amount of energy nor resources have been expended on these memorials. The recent memorials in Philadelphia and New York cost 2.75 million, 
5 million respectively. And the number and geographical spread of these monuments has expanded rapidly. Now just to give you an idea, just to give you some numbers in terms of geographical uh, distribution, monuments have been constructed in 20 of the 26 Irish counties in the Republic, a slightly larger proportion uh, in the western counties. There's a little over 50 famine monuments in Ireland itself in total. There's only four in Northern Ireland. Perhaps also not surprisingly, only a few monuments have been constructed in Britain. There's one in Cardiff in Wales. There's one in Carthen, Scotland, which is just outside of Glasgow. And also there's a monument in Liverpool. It's also a very small monument on Isla in Scotland. And to date, there's only two that I know of. Someone may correct me if I'm wrong. In Australia, uh, one is in Melbourne, and the other, of course, is here in Sydney. There's 10 in Canada. And there's more than 25 in the United States, where in particular I think the enthusiasm for building famine monuments has outstripped my ability to keep track of them all <laughs> over the years. <laughs> so I keep having to go back. But now just to talk a little bit about uh, some of the differences between uh, these monuments in, in these various different uh, countries. Now the siting of memorials has differed most substantially, I think, between Ireland and the U.S. The monuments in Ireland and Northern Ireland have been concentrated primarily in famine graveyards, former workhouses, and other sites which are redolent of local famine experience. Although these places tend often to be on the peripheries of towns and are seldom visited. They're not places you would come across uh, unless you were looking for them, really. And such as this uh, uh, cross, which is in Douglas County Cork. It's in the famine graveyard there that was used in unconsecrated burials actually right into the 1940s and 1950s. Physical residues uh, from the famine were frequently incorporated into memorial projects. You see here these soup uh, kitchen pots, which were used in the Carrick on Shannon uh, monument in Leitrim. So workhouse walls, millstones, etc., all of these form part of the physical material of many of these monuments. And in contrast, monuments in the diaspora were most often uh, placed in urban locations or expressly public settings like parks, and also generally make use of imported Irish materials in their construction sometimes utilizing keystones from Ireland, uh, standing stones, Irish trees or landscaping elements, such as this uh, image in, from Boston, which uses keystones that they uh, took from Cove, and a replica standing stone there in the middle. And in Ireland, in, in diaspora, whether we're talking about massive or humble monuments to the famine, the driving force behind monuments has usually been collectives of private individuals, not the any agency of the state. In itself, I think, is an interesting development. Most of these monuments have been grassroots projects. They're not coming from top down, as it were. And from an aesthetic point of view, the stylistic diversity of these monuments is truly remarkable. From reconstructed thatched cottages, such as the one here in Newmarket, County Kilkenny, to heart-shaped uh, fountains, this is outside Jury's Hotel in Limerick, to a one-quarter acre of Irish landscape, which is cantilevered in the middle of New York City. Now, so there's just a huge range of the types of forms that these take. But in most of these examples, the evocation of emotion has played an important role in framing famine experience for a public audience, whether through memorials meditation on the scale of death and loss, as is often the case in Ireland, or via figurative representations uh, on the emigrant, of the emigrant experience, as is often the case in the diaspora. Nevertheless, as I, as I mentioned already, most famine monuments uh, in the diaspora, with a few exceptions, display an intensely conservative visual approach, with a large number relying on what is actually a small body of 19th century prototypes, such as newspaper engravings, particularly from the Illustrated London News, and also the High Cross, the Irish High Cross, and as well megalithic reconstructions of passage tombs or standing stones. So again, despite the predominance of minimalism and uh, abstraction, other commemorative contexts, other commemorative monuments, which were happening at the same time in the 1990s, most famine commemorative committees have opted for traditional over progressive uh, memorial aesthetics. And major narrative themes wrought by these Irish, uh, by Irish memorials include acknowledgement of the past neglect of the famine poor, expressions of sorrow and solemn remembrance, and the direction of viewer attention to the sacred state of famine spaces. As might be expected within the US, Canada, and Australia, much greater emphasis has been placed on the emigrant legacy. In, in American examples, in particular, a celebratory tone of Irish immigrants' contribution and their descendants' success is also prevalent. And although these monuments inevitably bear the thumbprints of the 20th century, their appeal to the viewer and choice of iconography is usually rooted in the 19th. There's no shortage of shamrocks, coffin ships, nor bridges on plinths. <laughs> 
And so it's a way of highlighting the different ways in which the memory of the famine, how it's been constructed through these various uh, memorials. I'd like, to, I'd like to briefly consider a sampling um, of three of them in a little bit more depth. And the three I'd like to talk about are Dublin, Boston, and the home team here in Sydney. Um, that could perhaps best illustrate the diversity of approaches to the subject of the famine. And how public commemorations, palimpsestic layering of memory, image, and history reveals the poetics, the politics of the famine's legacy. So first we'll start uh, with Dublin, my hometown nowadays, as it were. So Dublin's Famine Memorial, which I'm sure many of you have seen or are familiar with uh, if you've visited Dublin, is located uh, in front of the Custom House on Dublin's Quays. And this began uh, life, actually, as a private work by the sculptor Rowan Gillespie, who would just, you know, to show you how close everything is in Ireland, he actually lives right behind my back garden, uh, where his foundry is. Uh, but anyway, <laughs> so he's just, he's, so you can almost see the smoke from his foundry when he's working on things. Anyway, but this sculpture, which he created, uh, or started developing privately, was donated um, by the, y, uh, or was purchased by the well-known Irish philanthropist Norma Smurfett. And it was subsequently uh, donated in 1997 to the Irish state and installed very quickly over nine months with the assistance of the Dublin Dolphins Authority and the Office of Public Works. And this sculptural group, um, which Rowan created, entitled Famine, consists of six gaunt, larger than life-size figures and a dog roughly modeled in bronze, clutching small parcels as they stagger along the quayside. Now, although this image of the famine sufferers uh, along the Dublin Quays strikes a vivid profile, they were in fact designed without this site in mind. Okay, so these, these sculptures were completely conceived independent of any site which came much later. And indeed, as a consequence of the, of the Docklands' uh, subsequent development, the Development Authority itself was only launched in 1997, the work today offers a far more, or occupies a far more prominent place than was the case in 1997. So they were quite peripheral at the time, but now, of course, the Docklands has become a, a major leisure and business area. And several of the figures here uh, draw from Gillespie's personal experience and the empathy he felt with the subject of the famine. The tall male figure is actually the face of his grandfather. It was, he, this Gillespie is described as a stern man who terrified him as a child. Also, of course, he was conscious of the uh, parallels often drawn between the Holocaust and the famine, and he used a concentration camp photograph as a basis for uh, this first female figure. But as he said, quote, to me that didn't matter. The sculpture is simply called Famine. It's not called the Great Famine. It's about the struggle to survive for people who haven't had food, end quote. The woman to the rear is based on Gillespie's older sister, Lorraine, who died very tragically at age 24 while struggling with drug addiction and anorexia. The male figure, who has a child uh, draped over his shoulders, derives from a famine account from Connemara, describing a father's desperate journey to find food for his child, a story which Gillespie related to his own experience as a father. His daughter also suffered from anorexia. And he said, I went through the experience of actually carrying the bundle uh, Sorry, I went through the experience of actually carrying this bundle up to her room, limp like a dead child. There's no horror in my life that was worse than that." End quote. The ragged surface of the bronze, which I think is the work's probably most significant aesthetic accomplishment, and these distended proportions of the figures accentuate the bleakness of the spectral figures and their haunted expression. However, complete avoidance of the monumental in this context, I think, is impossible. The fact that the figures have only been slightly enlarged, incidentally because Ron Gillespie cast all of his own work himself, he only physically cast figures of a certain size. So all of his sculptures are, are usually slightly more than life size. I think it doesn't, lead, it doesn't overly aggrandize their suffering to the point of banality or theater. In an interview, uh, Gillespie uh, remarked on the irony of the sculpture's adoption as a monument to the famine. He said, it's strange that everyone thinks of it as the famine monument, because everything I did was to try and stop it being monumental, thinking how humble and pathetic and lonely these people were, and then trying to make it so you almost become one of them, that you're with them. However, if the sculpture in Dublin has become the Dublin Famine Memorial, it's not for me to actually say, no, it's not. If that's what it represents to people, it has to be allowed to have a life of its own. Nevertheless, I think the use of emaciated bodies to represent the famine remains, in some cases, a problematic undertaking. The emotional trigger deployed by the specter of the gaunt famine victim is nearly always the product of a spectacular relationship between viewer and subject. And there are immense difficulties in guarding a realist figure statement against the temptations of a narcissistic sentimentality. 
an art critic for uh, the Irish Times, Aidan Dunn, expressed these kinds of reservations to the piece. And he said, Roland Gillespie's famine sculpture, it wouldn't be one of my favorite pieces. And I say that knowing it's a very popular piece of work and people do like it. I'm a bit uneasy about it because it seems to me an easy sentimental story. I think that perhaps art should do something more or a bit more than that. I don't think that it's far away from the Molly Malone sculpture, which is another incredibly popular sculpture, but it's borderline, well, in my mind, it's not borderline kitsch, Molly Malone is kitsch. The problem is that it's a relatively facile, sentimental piece of art that really doesn't do anything very much. So for Dunn, such narrative accessibility precludes the work from functioning as a genuine provocation, as the skillful rendering here of the famine figures impresses but never exceeds nor surprises uh, our presuppositions of the famine's brutality. And in this age of oversaturization of images of suffering and violence inflicted on the body, perhaps other strategies are necessary to jolt us out of the fictive complacencies we often find ourselves in. Now, as ever, of course, sight and context powerfully influence uh, the reception of public monuments. And a campaign led by Norma Smurfett to place names of wealthy donors under the feet of the figures caused great controversy uh, in Ireland. And Fitch and O'Toole, of course, was the first to weigh, weigh in on this, attacked the scheme and the instrumentalization of famine memory, which he felt prompted facile identification with the famine sufferer. He said, how fine it must be in these times when the petty people are murder murmuring about taxes and scandals to know that rich as you are, you are really one of history's victims. You may live in exile for tax purposes, but you are at one with these starved, hunted people about to embark on a coffin ship from the Dublin docks. But there you are, immortalized in bronze, your name stitched forever into a proud nation's tribute to the anonymous dead. And despite the initial installation of a few names uh, under the feet with Jerry Adams, John Hume, Michael Flatley, Gay Byrne, and Richard Branson, making up a somewhat odd collective, um, <laughs> And Smurfett's insistence that the names would not be obtrusive and placed at a distance. Uh, the project eventually lost momentum, and the initial efforts to create a sea of names under the figure's feet was unrealized. So there's very few there now today. And I think what this outcry cry demonstrates is that there are still continuing deep sensitivities over the ownership and the legacy of famine memory in Ireland that still resist easy resolution. And what was at stake was not issues around the famine's representation, but rather the ulterior motives underlying the commemorative act. Sharpened by an intensifying concern over the growing social inequalities and rising culture of greed that accompanied the accumulation of wealth in the wake of the Celtic Tiger. And in 2005, photographer John Kane won the inaugural Go Ireland Photography Award with his image from famine ships to partnerships, that's the title of the photo, um, a, dra a dramatic nightscape setting the famine group against the Dublin skyline with the Ulster Bank prominently illuminated against the starved figures. And this winning photograph uh, was published as a postcard through the John Hind group, the irony there, as part of an effort to seek new images capturing the spirit of contemporary Ireland. An image we can perhaps now look back on with no small degree of irony but also despair, as young Irish people now catch the airport shuttle a few steps away, compelled to emigrate once again in the wake of our recent, now self-inflicted economic collapse. So then to move on a little bit to talk about uh, the work in Boston. Now, the, the, I suppose the conflicting state of, of patronage uh, when it comes to and the, the presence of a single powerful individual uh, within public art projects uh, can be quite a complex uh, situation. And this was also the case with what's become probably the most controversial famine memorial projects, the Boston Irish Famine Memorial. This monument was created by Robert Schuer, and it's in a very central location in Boston on its, uh, what's termed its Freedom Trail, which is a network of American heritage sites connected along a heavily publicized uh, tourist route. As you can see, it consists of two bronze statues of three figures elevated on circular granite plinths. The first group depicts the, mis the misery and starvation of Ireland, and the second, a family group representing success in America, now well-fed, well-dressed, and striding confidently into the future. And the work is set in a large plaza surrounded uh, with extensive interpretative plaques. In 1997, the high-powered real estate developer, Thomas Flatley, met with the Boston mayor and agreed to take over leadership of this initiative. And Flatley himself was a, May a native of Mayo who emigrated to the U.S. In, the in 1950. And before his death in 2008, he'd become one of the top 300 wealthiest Americans with an estimated fortune of $1.4 billion. So he took up uh, the charge of, of uh, creating this monument and formed a committee in 1996. And his pride and the ambitions in the project were unequivocal. He called it the, the world's first full memorial to the famine victims, the mother of all memorials. 
very American, perhaps, a uh, way of articulating this. Um, but for him, the sculpture was not to be a grim portrayal of Irish suffering and estrangement. Rather, he sought to capture in bronze a literal representation in his own belief of America as the land of opportunity, and what he termed as, quote, the triumph that all, or all immigrants envision when they seek out the American dream. And his design committee included a cross-section of Boston's Irish elite. However, it didn't have any input from anyone involved in, with professional art or professional art qualifications. <laughs> uh, in the summer of 1996, a closed competition was held to solicit uh, possible designs for the memorial, and the sculptor Robert Shore was awarded a commission. It was, it was unveiled in 1998 to a crowd of over 7,000 spectators in Boston. Now, the artist uh, Robert Shore specializes in large public commissions uh, in his studio in Massachusetts, which are mostly based on figurative uh, depictions or commemorations of historic individuals. Uh, prior to the family memorial, his best known Boston work was a giant bronze teddy bear commissioned by F.A.O. Schwartz. Uh, it stands in front of the toy company. Now it's in front of the Boston Children's Hospital. So I think it's worth noting that really Shore makes his living essentially as a commercial sculptor. He responds directly to specific briefs with generally literal translations of the subjects that are requested by the committee. Uh, and so concerns over the visual and aesthetic expression of the piece seem to take a distinctly secondary role as easy readability of the suffering to success storyline uh, preoccupied the committee. And when I interviewed Schur about this work, he noted that the rapid time scale led to a work that a result that he felt was not fully resolved. So the thing I think I could say is that I felt with more time I could have made a better monument. It was one of the first big ones I ever did. A lot of times with this kind of work, you're not the one calling the shots. All in all, my main obligation is to the committee, not to what an art critic would or wouldn't say. Now, certainly critics had a lot to say um, about the work. And after the fanfare surrounding the unveiling died down, Fitton O'Toole, once again, stepped into the fray when he said, or he wrote rather, the actual monument, the permanent mark of this global maturing Irish identity, is a dreadful piece of kitsch. Beautifully crafted kitsch, certainly expensive kitsch, it costs a million dollars, but kitsch nonetheless. It shows not an ability to face our past, but a complete inability to imagine it. As a memorial to the dead, it offers pious cliches and dead conventions. As a memorial to the dead, or sorry, as an effort to confront national trauma, it shows a depressing immaturity. He excoriated the monument for its lack of emotional impact and what he called a beefy figure, or figure group redolent of a Stalinist or fascist aesthetic. Um, and although uh, his article didn't sit well with the committee, there was actually a, widely, a more widely read and more controversial review that cho followed shortly afterwards from Christine Temin, who's art critic with the Boston Globe. And this really launched the monument into the forum of heated public discussion. And she canvassed responses to the work from local art and museum professionals who called it an embarrassment, a missed opportunity, a cliched melodrama in an uh, incredibly visible public space. And her ire was especially directed towards Flatley's dominance of the project and the Boston Art Commission's permission for the project to proceed without any input from experienced art professionals, arguing that money, influence, and ignorance had combined to generate a poor product from a poor process. And letters in the Boston Globe poured in from both sides, some applauding for Temin for her appraisal, saying the healthy figures look more aliens than humans. It's caught in a dead formula, tasteless. Temin's review is bold, insightful. The dumbing down of our public art is shameful. It's an abysmal famine monument. And others attacked Temin's perceived elitism or in her targeting of Flatley, saying her review is grounded in intellectual snobbery, <coughs> condescending, paternalistic, and insulting. Flatley does not need to be told what good art is, nor should anybody else be told. My soul was stirred as I sat and gazed at the statues. The memorial is a marvelous portrayal of the irony of one of history's most cruel and inhuman episodes, forging the resilient and faithful Irish into Boston's and the nation's glorious heritage. I remember a committee member, perhaps, in the present. <laughs> and this is a one-sided, mean-spirited attack on Robert Shore, the Boston Art Commission, and Chairman Tom Flatley. What's interesting is that those who wrote in to support Temin, largely based on their commentary on the monument's formal success or failure, as it were, as a work of art, while her opponents took the opposite tact, defending the work in terms of its accessibility, taking umbrage with art world snobbery, or insisting on the sanctity of the subject matter. And in response, Flatley issued a very short statement reiterating his description of the, product, or of the project, but refrained from acknowledging any of her criticisms, save for responding, beauty is in the eye of the beholder. The, the intense response that was provoked uh, by the Boston Project is, is fairly unique, but I think, of course, the, the reasons for the furore can be broken down into several catalysts. 
First, of course, that there was no aspect of public uh, consultation, and this is quite unusual for any work um, of, uh, of public art. And it drew, it, it was executed over a very short span of time in comparison with most <coughs> public monuments. And the control exerted by the Boston Committee over the final product is unusual. Uh, most artists are given a little bit more flexibility and leeway with the kind of work they, they create. As well, there was already a contentious uh, climate in Boston over issues around public art uh, governance and oversight. And of course, it's the contentious issue of the famine's memory and legacy. And the assumption of the committee that their uncomplicated view of Irish famine heritage would be universally shared and celebrated attests to a certain narrowness of perspective, which denies history's contingency and our own complicity, I think, in uh, shaping the past. So unfortunately, the combination of all of these issues has relegated the Boston Irish Famine Memorial to anachronism instead of glorious aspiration. Four years later, and actually in a recent poll as well, um, polls of Boston's best and Irish public monuments have rated this monument at the very bottom. But despite this unfortunate outcome, I think the intentions of the committee in a flatly were certainly genuine, and their desire to connect with contemporary immigrant experience, uh, although occasionally tokenistic, was very commendable. But the call to famine memory without due consideration of its limitations and even falsehoods can prompt these sorts of meaningless and circuitous categorizations of self with respect to history and suffering. But if Schur's work embodies one strand of a kind of representational approach uh, to commemorating the famine, I'm going to conclude with just uh, discussing briefly today an alternative rendering, equally uh, the product of a committee initiative, but arguably one with a much more successful outcome. I know many of the folks in the audience were involved with this project, so they can feel free to correct me if I get any of this wrong. But in any case, uh, Mary Robinson visited Sydney in 1995 and sparked the interest in marking the famine's anniversary through the construction of a major memorial in the city. And the Great Irish Famine Memorial Appeal was established by a consortium of Irish community groups and led by Tom, uh, Chairman Tom Power, who's here uh, tonight. And in 1996, the committee had commissioned five artists to create proposals for a figurative monument with a project budget of around $35,000, which they subsequently presented to members of the Historic Houses Trust during a meeting. And at the time, several sites had been considered for a public monument, but the group favored Hyde Park Barracks. And of course, between 1848 to 1850, over 4,000 orphan girls were sent to Adelaide, Sydney, and Melbourne from Irish workhouses as a part of Earl Grey's assisted immigration scheme. And Hyde Park Barracks uh, processed and housed the young women until employment could be found for them. And so it's a very important site for Irish-Australian history. Unfortunately for the committee, uh, in the first instance, the Historic Houses uh, Trust uh, rejected all of the designs uh, submitted. And recalling the process, curator Michael Vogel noted that any monument had to be of quality, resonance, and sophistication that matches the work we do at the barracks. And he felt, and other committee members felt, that the, the figurative memorials proposed didn't meet those requirements and were considered inappropriate for the site. But despite uh, rejecting these initial designs, the Historic Houses Trust uh, decided to join with the committee and help them develop a suitable memorial for the barracks. And key to this was the formation of a new brief uh, that would base uh, the memorial on the experience of famine era, uh, f sorry, female migration uh, to Australia. And reflecting on this uh, new brief, the, here's an extract from that. The sculptural installation should symbolize this poignant experience of the forced migration of young Irish women. For many of these women, their futures were determined in Sydney's major immigration depot, the Hyde Park Barracks. The barracks was their point of arrival from the past and the gateway to a new life. The central themes of the sculpture are hunger and forced immigration, with a particular reference to the suffering of Irish women, but also their survival and achievement in a new land. And further language plainly sought to discourage the submission of independent figurative statues. Commemorative sculpture introduced to this historic precinct should not be an isolated artwork installed as an embellishment to the site, but should interact with the architectural design and symbolism of the barracks. So in response to this call for submissions, uh, 43, or 43 proposals were received. And finally, the husband and wife team of Hoshin and Angela Valamanesh were formally awarded the commission. And the monument was in, uh, inaugurated in September 1998 by Mary McAleese and unveiled in 1999. And in approaching uh, the Famine Project, both artists emphasized their view of the memorial as an artwork in its own right. Angela was saying, we were making a historic monument as such, but we wanted it to be a piece of sculpture. Of course, it's a memorial to the famine, but we wanted it to have sculptural qualities. And Hoshin saying, we looked at how an artwork can remember something rather than give a symbolic presence to the aspirations of the Irish people here. Although they were the ones for whom the work was done, we weren't offering them 
we were offering them an artwork. In that sense, it wasn't really dictated by the community or their aspiration, but in the end, they seemed to have taken it to heart. And really at the heart of their design is an architectural meditation on memory, loss, continuity, and uh, transition, which is cited, uh, centered at the side of the barrack seven wall. So after dismantling uh, the wall, a central section was rotated and rebuilt at an angle, creating a new sequence of spaces and perspectives in both the open spaces of the barrack courtyard and uh, the interior and the public street on the exterior. A, cast, uh, a table which is cast in bronze is bisected by the wall, each end set with a small three-legged stool and a single dish. And this roughly represents the two halves of the immigrant girl's experience. And nearby, there's a loy, which is a type of uh, spade, modeled in bronze, it leans against an adjacent niche cut into the wall, occupied by bronze models of a few shriveled potatoes. And on the interior side of the courtyard, the bowl and the tight.